we have, it's more important to get it fast than to get it right, um, and that you know this network of citizen journalists will um, correct any uh, inaccuracies. Well, fine, except that the inaccuracies are you know are still out there, are still living in in cyberspace. Um, and uh, I read just t today I was reading a post on a uh, popular journalism website um, where a blogger wrote in and he said, I quote, verification is for wimps. <laughs> so, you know, and by the way, this is all happening at the same time that civic education in our schools is declining. Um, you know, the, our, our children are not really being taught the value of being informed, you know, citizens and um, the importance of, of uh, you know, independent media um, to help us all be better, um, better citizens and a democracy is not really uh, deeply ingrained in kids today. Um, there's some unbelievable statistic, I can't remember off the top of my head, it makes my hair curl, um, where some incredible, more than half of the American high school students think that the First Amendment goes too far. Um, these are the kinds of things that, that you know, grind my teeth at night. <laughs> um, you know, just a couple weeks ago, for example, um, I'm taking a little bit of an open parenthesis here, but um, a couple weeks ago I wrote a column about this phenomenon in um, juries here in, in Massachusetts, a national problem that I was writing about locally here, where jurors are tweeting and blogging and doing internet searches on their PDAs while they're sitting on juries. And it's, you know, it's one thing to, sit, to, to think about you know, um, just the ubiquity of these devices, but it's another thing that they just don't seem to understand why they're not supposed to go rogue, you know, why they're not supposed to be researching the case on their own and looking into the defendant's past and finding out whether there was, you know, the guy's got a record or anything. The whole concept of, of um, you know, that, that you're supposed to only judge the facts and the law as it's presented to you in this sort of closed quarantine of a jury room, that's, that doesn't exist for a lot of younger people. And it's just the sense that anybody can be an expert, you know, because on the web, you know, not only do they not think you're not a dog, but they also, you know, don't know that you're not an expert. You can do, you can be your own expert on the web. You can look up your own medical symptoms. You can be your own journalist. You can, um, you know, get consumer tips from your, from your peers when you want to buy a new toaster or something. And so this ethic that, that everyone's an expert, I mean, everyone's a journalist, that means that nobody's a journalist, nobody's an expert. And I, I just worry about the, the, the way that that <clears throat> sort of culture is, is seeping into our society today. So, um, and then, you know, as Paul said earlier, newspapers matter in other ways too. They do provide this civic glue that he's talking about. Um, you know, the spring at the Globe, we run a, ran a story, just a little story about um, the Shea Vu Roller Rink, which is in Roxbury, it's a kind of a nice popular community center for kids, you know, in a neighborhood that's kind of um, had, had some difficult times. Um, and they were just about to shut down because they were running out of money. And, you know, because we ran this story in the newspaper, the owners read it and saw how important it was to the community and gave the owner a reprieve. Um, you know, the web is is by its nature transient and diffuse, and it um, doesn't command the collective attention of a place the way that a metropolitan newspaper does, providing that civic glue that's so important to us, especially at a time when the society is increasingly atomized into niches. Um, that's one other thing, one other concern, I might be my last thing I'm gonna say about uh, the web, is the tendency it has for people to gravitate to the websites um, where they already agree with the political view. Um, the thing about uh, newspapers is, in a, metro newspapers, in addition to being on the wrong side of the you know paper versus web um, continuum, we're also on the wrong side of the sort of general interest versus narrow cast interest. Metro newspapers are general interest papers. They have, I'm sure they have the, you know, the editorial page is liberal, the Globe's liberal, the Herald's not liberal. Um, but the paper itself um, represents a kind of broad interest. You know, you have a kind of serendipity. You're turning the pages, you don't really know what you're interested in until you see a story and go, wow, East Timor, who knew? You know, this is really interesting to me, or, or something. Um, 
you're exposed to a variety of topics. Um, yes, an elitist group of editors, um, professionals trained, but yes, you know, specialists have chosen for you what the things that you know we think are the most important in the news that day. Um, but it's a broad spectrum of, of topics. And on the internet, people, it tends to be an echo chamber. People tend to go, and on TV too for that matter, people tend to go to um, websites and TV talk shows where they're going to be reinforced in the views that they already have as opposed to being exposed to a broad variety of views. And that's another concern I have about, um, about the internet sort of uh, taking over with the role of the traditional metro newspaper. You know, so that's why this financial crisis that we're having in American journalism is not just a problem for journalism students or for, you know, people who own stock in newspaper companies. Um, it's a problem for every citizen and every worker and every parent. Um, I don't know the, what the solutions are going to be. I'm hoping that maybe Dan Ogren will have a few ideas, um, but I sure know the stakes. Thank you.
Uh, easy for me to say. I'm not the one who would have gone from being extremely profitable to losing a lot of money and then trying to make it across that chasm to get to the point where the revenue can come in again. Um, although I think that we should remember that for many of these newspapers that we mourn today and whose circumstances are so terrible, for years they had unbelievable monopolies and made spectacular profits in the 25, 30, 35 percent on sales, far more than any other industry I know of in this country. And maybe, maybe there was something that they and their stockholders had stowed away over the years that could have been put against the losses that they have to have to get to the next place. So how do we get to the next place? Uh, I don't know, or, or not how do we, I certainly don't know how we get there, but once we're there, what is the next place? And, and so I've been trying to think, talk to other people, and come up with ideas about how we might continue to have quality journalism, or how we might again have quality journalism uh, in a digital world. Um, first, I think, uh, I, I know it says uh, Metro newspaper, I'm going to talk a little bit about national newspapers uh, for a moment, and I think that you're supposed to be here. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll keep going now. Um, the, uh, uh, the national newspapers. Um, I think that Renee's formulation, if you'll forgive me, is a little bit wrong on the mathematics. And the national level, maybe it's different than the local level, the national level, the New York Times, which has by far the most uh, costly news operation of any print medium in America, uh, last I checked, uh, was $250 million a year to create the content of the newspaper. But about a billion dollars a year to put out a newspaper because of all of those other costs. So how much revenue do you need? How much, what, once you take out those costs, the money we need to come in to cover it may not be as much as, as we fear it. So in, in, in terms of the globe, if the cost of the newsroom might, do you know what the figure is? I'm guessing it's probably $60 million a year, something like that. So those $100 bills to get $60 million, it begins to not be so scary. Uh, on the basis of the Times, which may be in a distinctive situation, certainly as a national and international newspaper, it's, it's uh, uh, different from the metros. Um, I did the math a couple of years ago, and it's time for me to catch up on it right now. There are 15 million people, who uh, unique users, who go to the New York Times online every month. Uh, there are something like 6 million who do it two or three times a week. If 21% of those were willing to pay $100, $100 a year, 100, well actually $110 a month, 21, 22% of those did, they would cover that $250 million. Uh, the, hmm? $100 a month? No, no, $100 a year. $10 a month, $120 over the course of the year, they would cover the $250 million. So they say right now we're not bringing enough money online, uh, you know, because we're only having this advertising revenue, and if we start to charge for it, we're going to lose a lot of our readers. Well, you can lose 75% of your readers and perhaps still cover the cost of the newsroom. Um, another model I think that we might look to that I begin to think of in national terms but could, but, but could apply locally as well uh, is really something similar to the, if we decide that there's a national and, and local civic virtue in, in, in journalism, uh, income tax checkoff. What if there were on the income tax form, on the 1040, as there has been for political contributions for many years, a little box, and you check that box, and if so, you have three dollars to go to journalism. Now, I'm sure somebody would say, well, we don't want the govern government funding journalism because of the government's own interests, and I agree with that. But what if attached to that box, there were a list of people or organizations to whom you were sending your three dollars? I want to send my three dollars to the newspaper that Renee Loft runs. You want to send it to the one that Bill O'Reilly runs. We want to send it to this organization or that organization. Let's say we had a model where, if on the national basis, if 25 members of Congress signed something, you could get on this ballot, and you would have, in a country of 300 billion people, something between half, half a billion and a billion dollars that could be channeled as a public good to not-for-profit organizations doing good journalism. Um, I think that could even be taken down to the local level if each of these organizations on the tax checkoff were a foundation that was then in a position to distribute to local organizations that bought into the same standards and values that we cherish. One of the things that I think that we also need to think about in terms of payment on the web is that for the first time, in my knowledge, in the history of uh, media, um, the advertiser knows whether the advertisement is working. Uh, in 1985, a man named Paul Zuckerman, who was the media director of a uh, very large firm called Doyle, Dane and Bernbeck, advertising firm, said to me the reason why he advertised in magazines, and this applies to newspapers as well, is he was afraid that advertising magazines might work. 
And if it did work, he better be there, but he didn't know whether it really worked. Locally, you know whether Star Market's ad is working if they're advertising lamb chops at a discount because they know how many lamb chops they sell that, that weekend. But generally speaking, advertising that we, we, we encounter on a large scale, no one knows whether it works. Well, on the internet, you know whether it works. Um, there's a click. You can ask your, the, the viewer, click here, click there, click here, buy something, do not buy something. You can absolutely measure something. That has turned out to be terrifying for some people. Uh, if they have, uh, uh, if they're offering a, a reading product that people don't uh, aren't reading, uh, but for those of us who are drawing people in, for any organization drawing people in, having that is, provides an opportunity for real revenue. And the second way it provides an opportunity for revenue is it gives the receiver a choice. So if you will imagine with me the device that we'll be reading on in two years or five years or seven years, and believe me, the technology is going unbelievably quickly. Uh, the device we'll be reading on has a response mechanism in it. And this ad comes up from Coca-Cola. And I'm sitting on the beach in Truro, and if I want to get what I'm reading for free, then I've got to respond to various things in the Coca-Cola ad. So Coca-Cola knows that the impression has been made. They know I'm there. Or I can say, damn it, I hate these Coca-Cola ads. Click here and pay a dime for whatever it is that I'm reading. The, the new digital technology makes possible ways of collecting revenue that never existed before. Now, locally, and I'll, and I'll finish because our next speaker is here. Um, locally, it's a, it's, it is unquestionably a, a, a tougher issue. Uh, and Renee is absolutely right uh, about the field day that uh, uh, thieves and scoundrels can have in local government. I and mean, right now, they're in so many cities across the country, uh, the, the uh, public thieves are just waiting. They just see the, as they see the newspaper drive. Uh, uh, the newspapers die, uh, they will move in, and it's going to be pretty scary. But I think that there are ways that some of these ideas can be extended into the, the local model in a couple of ways that I've already indicated. But I'm imagining some new models of gathering of, of journalism and its dissemination. For instance, let us say here in Boston, I could present to the, the 5 million people in the metropolitan era, area a really great higher education reporter who is going to file online three or four times a week, a wonderful story that would tell you everything you need to know about higher education. How many people in Greater Boston would pay $5 a month to get that? Anybody want to throw out a number? Oh, well, no, I said I would. You would. Okay, one, at least, that's a start. <laughs> five million, let's say, well, let's say 10% uh, would be 500,000, 1% would be 50,000. How about one-tenth of 1% one of the people in Boston being willing to do that? Will we accept that number? That's $300,000 a year for that reporter. Believe me, that reporter's not making that kind of money at the Boston Globe. Because what you need now to get into the, the business is a brain and a laptop and some shoe leather. If I wanted to compete with the Boston Globe in the old era, I needed $100 million to buy myself printing plants some paper and a lot of other things. Now the barrier of entry is down very, very far. Is that person at risk to the libel suit? Yes. Is that person able to sue the Pentagon? No. Is it possible that people like that can aggregate into, a, into groups that collectively insure each other? Absolutely. Is it also possible that aggregators could find the great education reporter, the science reporter, the this reporter, the that reporter, and offer a package to you, and I split the money, I'm the aggregator, I split it with other people? What do we call that? We call that an editor, a newspaper, but in a very different model, in a very different way. So, I'm upset by everything that's happened. Uh, I have, I'm fortunate because I'm old, I don't need a job any longer. Uh, they can't fire me. Um, and I do worry as a reader that I won't have something that has ink that rubs off on my hands and my shirt every morning. Uh, on the other hand, if we think that it's the content that matters, if we think that it is about the words and the ideas uh, and focus on that, I think we can come up with ways to get us past this very sad time and into a pretty decent future. Thank you. Well, Paul tells me I'm up, so I'm up. Um, and I'm going to say a few words. I was struck, first of all, by the uh, title of tonight's uh, forum, The Plight of the Metro Newspaper. It would be better not to have a plight. I've been in this business just long enough to remember when newspapers didn't have a plight, when we were still rich and uh, fat and happy. And those days obviously are behind us, as the previous speakers I'm sure have told you about in great detail. 
My name is Adrian Walker. I'm a columnist at the Boston Globe. I should start by apologizing for being late. Unfortunately, I was on deadline writing a column for tomorrow's paper about a young lawyer who just shook Walmart down for $40 million, which I consider commendable. And <laughs> I have planned to be done at 4 o'clock and took until 6.15. That's how, it, that's how it goes in a Metro newspaper. But I'll just say a couple of things. Um, you know, obviously our business is going through very difficult times. I mean, I've been, I've been a reporter since, I don't know, 1985 or something like that. And in that time, our business has changed dramatically, and mostly not for the better. But I'm an optimist, really, about the future of the Metro newspaper. I think that, you know, as, uh, going back to some of the things Dan was talking about when I walked in, I think the form of it is changing, but I think the desire for what we do, the desire for news, the desire for information, the desire to be connected to one another as a community in a way that newspapers allow for is not going away and is not going anywhere. I think the form of it is changing and we don't know exactly what that is, what that form is going to be. But, but you know, that doesn't scare me. I don't think that news, I can't imagine newspapers dying and I don't think that newspapers are dying. And one of the things that interests me about this topic is that the idea of cities and the idea of newspapers are so inextricably linked to me, you know. I've been a city reporter for essentially all of my career, and my whole desire to be a journalist is about writing about cities, and I can't imagine major cities without newspapers. I can't imagine major cities where we don't know or don't care what's going on in City Hall or in the State House. And I know that it's going to survive, and that we're going to figure out, you know, exactly how it is it's going to work. It's going to be some form of making people pay for what they now get for free. I never quite understood how we figured out, how we decided we could sell the paper and give it away. And I think we're on the verge of figuring out that that doesn't work. And clearly we don't know exactly what's going to come next, but there will be a next, and there's going to be another hundred years of what we've been doing. And I, I really believe that, and I look forward to, obviously not all of it, but to seeing what form exactly that's going to take. So with that, I'll be happy to uh, join the discussion after a break. Thank you.